our panelists, uh, starting with Mr. Uh, Charles Mudd, Jr. Uh, he is a 23-year uh, legal veteran. Um, please take a seat. Um, next up is Daniel Mater. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Daniel Mater, he is uh, uh, eight years as a strategy and business consultant, currently working at Hawaii Park now. Uh, next up is Ken Balchak. All right. <laughs> Um, he is a uh, tenure senior manager at uh, Far Horizons uh, at our uh, Chicago's very own Adler Planetarium. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. David Hurst. Um, he is the uh, founder and CEO of Orbital Transports and the, uh, the president of this organization that you're at right now. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time tonight. All right, um, a quick... Um, Quick round of housekeeping. Uh, exits are that way, so are the bathrooms, uh, but not quite as far to the exit. Um, the the format that we're going to have tonight is that we're going to uh, start off with questions that are pre-prepared. Um, some of uh, some of our audience members ask questions in advance, so we will be. Um, we will be uh, answering those right off the bat. And then uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then after we come back, we're going to take uh, audience questions. Sounds good? All right. All right, cool. Um, with that said, one, I'm going to start off with a really, really easy question. So uh, satellite constellations versus mega satellite constellations, uh, what is the difference between those two? Um, Dave, you, you're, uh, you're a veteran in the uh, space logistics industry. Could you start us off? Sure. So um, historically, satellite constellations um, consisted of, I'll say, a handful of, of satellites uh, that is growing over time. Uh, currently, I think the largest constellation in existence is on the order of 100, less and less than 200 satellites. Uh, what we're talking about in terms of mega uh, constellations is in the thousands or potentially more than that. So it's basically an order of magnitude. size um, of the constellation. So that, that's kind of what we're talking about. And currently right now, uh, there are roughly around 2,000 satellites in orbit. Uh, as, as we've all seen in the, uh, in the graphic, by the end of the decade, there's going to be 57,000, uh, or potentially more, because that, uh, that, that slide was uh, a little bit dated. What, What's, what's contributing to this explosive increase in the number of satellites that, that are going up and, you know, in either, you know, the market space, the technology space, and even in the regulatory space? Uh, I'm going to open it up. Yeah, I mean, I, I will jump into the fray. Uh, I think that it's the emergence of the new commercial space industry and the intersection of companies like SpaceX, OneWeb, um, Amazon, and so forth. Um, and at the same time, with government wanting to look to the private sector to facilitate um, the exploration there. But you know, using the numbers that you just talked about, about 2,000 functional satellites orbiting, um, just you look at SpaceX alone, 12,000, it has license for 12,000 satellites and is actually looking for authorization through the International Telecommunications Union for an additional 30. So SpaceX itself, with the Starlink mega constellation system, is looking at 42,000 satellites. Not that they'll, you know, there's some debate as to whether or not they actually want to launch or will launch those 30,000 that they're looking for, but at least right now, they've got the largest bulk of uh, authorizations. For uh, some of our audience members who might not know what Starlink is, could you please describe that real quick? Sure. So, Starlink is SpaceX's mega constellation, the, all of those satellites. And what it's going to be is like a constellation of satellites rather than an individual satellite um, at a particular point and just being by itself. A constellation are going to have the satellites connected. So, SpaceX. The goal of SpaceX with Starlink is to basically provide worldwide internet connection. They altruistically say that they'll be able to provide internet 
service to the remote regions of the desert or the middle of the ocean, but it should come as no surprise that, and I like SpaceX, I like Elon Musk, but it comes as no surprise that the first 800 of Starlink satellites are gonna be over North America, which is where they're gonna provide the internet service first. But So Starlink is that satellite, and it really is the one, in my mind, and I'd welcome my panelists to uh, comment, is really the impetus or, or what woke up everybody to mega constellations of satellites. In May of last year, there was a photograph that was taken in the Netherlands with 60 Starlink satellites going across the night sky as they've been launched. And the reflection of the panels was really significant. And so that's really what caught um, a lot of communities off guard, including astronomers, astrophysics community that Here's a wake-up call with a streak of satellites going. Um, that's the Starlink that, that you'll read about or talk about. I think as well, just the reason we're seeing the advent of mega constellations today uh, is the decreased access to space. And so if you think about the cost of a rocket launch, call it 30 or 40 years ago, um, or even if we go as recent as call it 10 or 12 years ago, you're looking at a couple hundreds of millions to, if we're talking space shuttle, potentially a billion dollars of launch like what you're looking at. Now when you look at SpaceX, you know, their manufacturer suggested retail price for launch is roughly eighty thousand a third, so not eighty thousand, it is roughly eighty million dollars. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, yes. uh, and so as it's gotten so much cheaper to access space, that's then created a a lot more opportunity has really uh, brought in the base of institutions, organizations and students and entrepreneurs that have been able to develop some kind of satellite, be it a CubeSat or uh, some other kind of technology demonstration that they want to do, it's now been so much cheaper for them to actually get access to space. And so when we think of constellations that maybe existed or that were launched 20 years ago, I think the GPS constellation is 16 or 20 satellites, something on that order. Uh, and every single one of those satellites, I'm pretty sure launched on a single rocket. Um, today we're thinking that I think the record right now is almost 200 satellites were launched on a single rocket by the Indian Space Research Organization a couple years ago. And so all of a sudden you can get much cheaper access to space with providing a much greater number of satellites to space. And so your limitation on the financial side is just that much less. And so you're seeing even schools, even middle schools, being able to you know, get on board a rocket and have a one year CubeSat that you know, tracks the time or something like that. I'll, I'll just follow on what you said there. In, in addition to the reduced launch costs per satellite, we're also seeing a significant advance in the technology that can be put into the smaller space. And so a lot of the satellites that are providing our communications capabilities now sit out in geosynchronous orbit. They're 24,000 miles out, um, and they, they sit over one point above over the globe all the time. Those satellites are intended to operate 15 years, 20 years, something like that. And if you're gonna if you're gonna put that kind of satellite up there, you're gonna expect that it's gonna operate for that period of time. And so the amount of investment that goes into building that satellite is quite significant. So it's not just the launch cost was expensive, but the cost of the satellite itself is very expensive. You're talking hundreds of millions of dollars potentially to put one communication satellite in geosynchronous orbit. With the advent of what what Dan referred to as CubeSats or small satellites, you can now put an equivalent functionality into something the size of that refrigerator right there, um, or even smaller. Um, CubeSats are about this size, the size of a shoebox. And so the cost of creating a satellite that size is very low, um, $100,000 less than that even, depending on what you're doing. Um, and so then it becomes very cost effective to create a lot of them. Uh, and if you lose one, the, the sunk cost is relatively low. So it becomes very feasible to put up a lot of them. You expect you're going to lose some of them. You're going to replace some of them in six months, a year, two years. Um, and so that cycle becomes much more uh, feasible. And so now it becomes very, um, the, the opportunity to put up larger numbers of, of small satellites just one point to give you a sense on the size though and to make sure that there's no misunderstanding. Starlink satellite is not a CubeSat. 
It's uh, basically four meters squared by 1.8 by 1.2, and this, it has two solar arrays that are each 12 square meters. So it's it's a larger piece of equipment. So uh, I want to stay, stay with you, Mr. Mudd. Um, Charles is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, thank you. Um, have there been, has the regulatory space, meaning government, um, been kind of slow to catch up to all the advancement that's been happening in technology and the market space that's driving this push to go up in space? Yes. And two very brief examples um, that are relevant quite recently is the FCC regulations. Uh, there's one particular regulation that relates to whether or not there's an environmental impact, for example, on um, anything with respect to FCC, but let's say launching a satellite. There's a checkbox on the application whether or not there's a significant environmental impact under a particular statute and if it, or regulation. And if you look at that regulation, it's really talking about terrestrial aspects, whether there's going to be an interference on you know sensitive lands like Native American lands or whether it's going to have an effect on light pollution or radiation. It does not talk about anything above the terrestrial aspects. That was last updated in 1986, and in fact, the FCC, in, in reviewing that regulation at the time and considering the environmental impacts, essentially said, we believe that nearly everything that we do really has nothing to do with the environment, so we're gonna categorically exclude almost everything. Now, what the FCC was doing was looking at guidance from the Council on Environmental Quality, CEQ, and their regulations that are basically, the CEQ um, is a part of the office of the White House, but it was created in 1969 to ensure that federal agencies would consider environmental aspects of their conduct or, or what was in their jurisdiction. Those regulations, likewise, were last updated more than 40 years ago. And so only recently has um, there been an impetus or an effort to modernize, I'm going to say modernize in quotes, the regulations. Um, because if you look at some of the proposals, they're, they're very anti-environment. But in any case, there is the impetus now to modernize the regulations. They had hearings in February. One in, uh, one day was in Denver, one day was in D.C. And today was actually the deadline for public comments on the regulations. So in answer to your question, yes. I mean, the CEQ, more than 40 years, and the last time that the FCC looked at that kind of scope on what the environmental impact might be, such as the night sky and so forth it was 1986. And I want to I want to jump back to the night sky in a little bit, but before I do that, um, I want to you know for you know we're all we're all everyday consumers here, right? Um, with the advent of the mini constellation satellites, um, what are you know how, how is the average person's life going to change? And what what other what products or services are we going to have now that we might not have, that we currently don't have because of this technology? So I can take a first pass at that one. There's a bunch of really cool uh, applications related to some of these major constellations. The reason we're seeing Starlink uh, generate so much press is one, because it's you know, an Elon Musk company that he loves to tweet about, and so we're obviously gonna just see a lot more on social media and in the news about it. But then also, Starlink is planning to provide satellite-based internet. And so as a consumer, the expectation or the expectation that Elon is trying to set for all of us is that we'll be able to have worldwide satellite-based internet that can provide connectivity, potentially at faster bandwidth, and I'm pretty skeptical on that front, but also in areas that might otherwise not have fiber optic cable or might not have other types of internet. But that's just the kind of immediate, call it one to two year time horizon of what we're thinking of for applications today. If we broaden the use of some of these mega constellations and think more about the Internet of Things or the or the industrial 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 Internet of Things, you can broaden that to marine tracking, you can broaden that to connected aircraft. 
And so that's a connected aircraft, not just from the standpoint of the GoGo and the Viasat we think of today that drive the like, semi-frustrating, uh, you know, constantly hitting reload on a plane, just trying to get a Twitter to load or something. You know, that's uh, you know just one form of connected aircraft. But then if you also think of uh, Malaysian Airlines flights 370, 37, whichever one of those that had disappeared, uh, connected aircraft can also be constellations that will actually track aircraft um, over areas that don't have radar. And so that's really exciting. But then as well, if you begin to broaden that to also think about transportation, uh, when we see companies like GM or Uber or Lyft investing in autonomous vehicles, a big part of an autonomous vehicle is being able to have a bunch of sensors that can collect as much data from as much of the surroundings as you can possibly have. And having some kind of mega constellation that can provide telecommunications, that can provide you know, more sensor awareness to, to the vehicle, or even something as basic as providing more real-time updates to traffic or, you know, this road is closed or this road no longer exists. Um, those are things that we're all going to have immediately accessible to us as we see technology like autonomous cars or other forms of industrial internet of things, devices, um, exist in the world. So I, I think a lot of those applications that you're talking about are communications applications, um, but since you previously worked for Planet, which is an Earth observation company, and they, they put up one of the first large constellations, can, can you speak to Earth observation? So Earth observation is a really cool one. So when we think of Earth, when we think of Earth observation today, a lot of the pictures that we're going to see of Earth are going to be coming from uh, satellites that are owned by governments. Right. So it's you know very large satellites. Sometimes resolution can be really great. If you go on Google Maps and you zoom in on your home, right, to see which car is parked in the driveway, uh, those images came from a company called Digital Globe. Uh, they're a private provider that uh, gets paid hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars a year to sell all of their images to the government. Um, a lot of those images, when, you know, when you've gone to Google Maps and zoomed in on your home, sometimes they've been six months old, a year old, a couple years old, maybe. Uh, with the advent of mega constellations, or constellations that can number on the order of many hundreds or thousands, all of a sudden the revisit rate of a particular area can be significantly increased to the point where when I put out as a planet labs, we were actually able to image the entire land mass of the Earth every single day. And in some major populated areas where we had a greater density of satellites that had like, uh, particularly phased orbits, we would then be able to have a revisit rate of multiple times a day for certain places. And so being able to have a lot of that real-time tracking is really interesting. Uh, the, the use cases for that can be applied to everything from disaster relief, where if there's a mudslide or a landslide or a hurricane, being able to figure out other populations that don't have access to recovery workers, but then also to agriculture, figuring out when a farmland is to be plowed and at the optimal time, all the way even to defense and intelligence, where you know has, have, have troops moved in a certain way within a certain time frame. Uh, so being able to have that kind of revisit rate is really powerful. So basically what you're telling us is we're going to have fully autonomous cars, <laughs> we're, no one's going to be bothered by disasters again, we're gonna, everybody's going to have high agricultural yields, uh, and we're going to be safer because of all, all, all the defense stuff. Um, 100%. What, yeah. what, well, what, what do you think, think uh, I'm going to be asked the next question? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> what? Oh, okay. I might be the curmudgeon in this group. So. Okay. <laughs> well, this leads me to the next question. Like all, like all this is, um, you know, seen through the lens of you know rose tinted glasses. What are there? No technology goes without its downside, right? What, what are some of those negative aspects of um, you know what the, what this type of technology would bring? Um, I'm gonna kind of rip off what you were starting to say at, about um, environmental protection, um, and you know our our orbital space is part of our environment um, and there are things that you know what are we trying to protect um, and in this case uh, where if everybody saw the video that was running earlier um, you know if we have I'll just give you a few little stats that actually what I have is uh, from US Space Command they track anything that's about the size of a grapefruit and larger um, and that's not just functioning satellites payloads but uh, you know Second stage rockets, uh, you know, a debris and things like that. And um, at this point, they track 5,547 payloads. Those are active payloads. Um, 
the entire. Yes, and the total things they track though, those are so a little over 5,500 payloads, um, and the total amount of things they're tracking is over 45,000. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, a lot of that is defunct, um, uh, un still orbiting satellites. In fact, um, Vanguard 1 launched in 1958, still being tracked. Um, now, if you have, okay, satellites, that's fine. Um, if they have what's supposed to be a mitigation strategy of at least, for example, for CubeSats, has a 25 year lifespan. And you, you have to show some way, typically through atmospheric drag or some other methods, that you can bring your satellite down within 25 years. Um, not sure how stringent the uh, actual um, controls of that are. Uh, if you're in, at this point, not so much. Exactly. It's just taking your word on it and taking a little bit of physics on it. Um, so <laughs> what we're doing is we're loading up low Earth orbit um, and you know up to maybe about 500 kilometers or so around that with um, a lot of objects. Uh, so that number I gave you, about 45,000 tracked objects, just to let you know, uh, you might have heard about a couple of events. It's one of the, uh, the Cosmos uh, 2251 back in um, 2009 collided with an Iridium satellite. Um, and it was, the Iridium satellite was actually functioning, the Cosmos uh, wasn't. So what happened was uh, it just became a, a mess of debris. And then uh, the other biggest one was in 2007 with the Fengyu uh, 1C uh, weather satellite that the Chinese government uh, deliberately um, destroyed in a, you know, sort of a test for doing space defense. Um, just to let you know that the amount of debris from those two events contributes to 10% of all the tracked uh, material in space. Those two events. Now, you probably heard of Kessler syndrome, where once you have a lot of things in space, especially if they're not, if they're not orbiting in the same orbit, they can actually have a collision speed of about 32,000 miles per hour. Um, Do you mind explaining the Kessler syndrome? Um, yes, so like I said, all those things being tracked right now, 45,000. Um, if you ever have a collision between any of those two things, especially if it's a substantially large object, at those velocities, uh, you're going to pretty much have a destructive event. That destructive event, as I said, um, for, contributed to over almost 4,200 objects that are now uh, uncontrolled orbits flying through low Earth orbit. Um, well, now you just had a, a huge increase in the amount of projectiles. If those projectiles hit other uh, satellites, then you've just increased that, and it could actually be an exponential runaway. Um, so that's where, instead of 45,000 objects, now just to let you know that, one other thing I wanted to mention was that of all objects ever launched in the space uh, that were tracked, 61% of them are still up there. Big. So, now imagine if, uh, and that's since 19, well, things that happened come back down, so since 1958. Now, uh, I just want to link this back together to what Charles was saying. I don't take too much time here, but um, the, the, what are we trying to protect? Well, if you could imagine a, a, a low Earth orbit that's um, scattered with debris, um, being able to have a mega constellation to do all these wonderful, I mean, yeah, these are incredible technologies, incredible things. If you can't do them anymore, uh, we're sort of, we destroyed, in a sense, another environment. Um, there's, uh, and then two other points I want to make about the protect, what are we protecting? So that could have a huge commercial effect. I mean, you know, it could pretty much uh, ground almost all uh, low Earth orbit um, work that you want to do. Um, second thing is uh, the visible night sky. Um, might not have as bad of an impact as you think. Uh, Gaza and I were actually running the numbers to me. Um, where for observational astronomers, there's a lot of things out there. If you get to that point that we saw earlier on that little rolling movie, um, if you have tens of thousands of satellites, um, typically they're only visible um, when uh, if they're near the um, limb of the Earth, the sunlit limb of the Earth. By nighttime, they're usually dark. It's not as bad of an impact of visual astronomy that I would have thought, but uh, got to be a visual astronomer. Um, but the one thing I will say that is a big impact when it comes to our natural world is uh, radio. The, the radio transmissions from all these, the downlinks, the uplinks, the interlinks between satellites um, creates a radio noise. Uh, some of those frequencies that are being used um, really impinge on our exploration of the universe when it comes to radio astronomy. Um, 
and just give one example. Um, the I think it's the uh, OneWeb and uh, and also the Starlink um, the downlink from Starlinks are actually right at the frequency. Just it's a, a 10.7 gigahertz, which 10.6 gigahertz is actually a, a, a band that is hydroxyl band. That's a very important. Um, uh, signal that we can use to explore the universe. Um, so, uh, if we start interfering on that, that science can be lost. <laughs> My high hopes. <laughs> no, that's, that's excellent. Does anyone else have any other uh, negative aspects of this technology? Well, I, I just asked Ken, though, uh, to, if you have like a couple examples of recent discoveries mm -hmm. that have come out through radio astronomy that, that we might have heard about. Um, well, actually, the Event Horizon Telescope you might have heard about uh, last year was easily awarded like one of the most you know, scientific advancements of, of, of the year, which was we actually imaged the, the black hole, uh, the black hole in a galaxy in 87. Um, that was the result of microwave and radio astronomy um, from literally a, a world collective of telescopes. Um, I was looking into how much the, 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 the key, 236 gigahertz, 86 gigahertz, signals were where they're um, focusing their observations. There's, at this point, there's not too much interference in, the, in that, but I can see that being a pinch. I will give you one good example, the CMB, the discovery of the, uh, is it the cosmic uh, uh, microwave background radiation from the Big Bang, which was a Nobel Prize winning discovery. Um, the, it's an it's a observation that needs to be made in many frequencies. Some of those are very, very heavily stepped on um, by what's, you know, when you have a handful of satellites transmitting in frequencies that you could discover the beginning of the universe in, it's not that bad. You can plan and uh, out do your observations in between those passes. But if it's a mega constellation, literally almost flooding the skies, we might not have discovered where the universe came from. I mean, does that mean it's the end of the ground based astronomy? It's radio astronomy and is the most impacted, I think, through um, through communications, uh, through comms, satellite comms. And there's some protections that are, are put in place, some restrictions put in place, but once again, that compliance is a little spotty, and I, I don't know what the ITU's uh, like stringent approaches to those things are. There's um, uh, side lobe signals that actually interfere from iridium satellites into um, uh, some very uh, precise uh, radio telescope observations that would be impacted. So in a sense, a little bit of a battle between the commercial and the scientific. So, so I guess, yeah. uh, I was really impacted by the counter around the Kessler syndrome and the extent to which you kind of have a domino effect of there's one satellite collision that causes more. Um, I'm probably not the only person in this room that has seen the movie Gravity uh, with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney, where Sandra Bullock essentially just like hops from space station to space station, despite the fact that they're in a wildly different orbit. Um, but uh, I guess to uh, to what extent uh, would something like a mega constellation uh, allow for like a similar type of event where it really is a domino effect where uh, the debris kind of just continues to get bigger over a very short period of time? Is that a serious risk that we might face? Yeah, I mean, when you have more targets, you, know, you have more uh, potential debris, when you have more potential debris. Um, you know, if, if space is big, space, even orbital space is quite large, but at some point, if you hit a, like you said, a tipping point where there is that domino effect, the, the chances, I mean, even after these 2007, 2009 events uh, of the destruction or the collision of satellites, there's been no, uh, Subsequent known, yeah, but that's just because we've been lucky so far. It's just kind of like you know the dinosaurs thought they were lucky too until something happened. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, to to kind of go off of that, you know, um, we we've seen you know how, how many satellites are going to be going up. You know, orbital space is going to be eventually it's going to be a resource, right? It's, it's going to be something that um, people want. Um, I mean, could you potentially see that there are you know uh, International tensions rising and wars fought over specific regions in space. Space force. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think you're seeing. Space force, yes. <laughs> I think you're already beginning to see some of that. I think not from a straight government standpoint, but you're certainly seeing a lot of conflict. And you can press people a little bit more to this call, but you're certainly seeing a lot of conflict around people 
uh, trying to buy additional spectrum rights or trying to kind of lay claim to uh, a certain amount of satellites that they're going to be able to launch that they get to call dibs on that amount of spectrum or just that amount of application that get granted in a certain year. And so um, I think you're seeing from a commercial standpoint, folks are already trying to jockey and be pretty, pretty competitive. I think from like a government standpoint of, you know, are we going to have like designated like, you know, American flag on the moon kind of situations, uh, I think that's probably a little bit ways out, but certainly. Yeah, I mean, I would, I'll talk to that just briefly, and again, going to an earlier comment um, on the antiquated nature of governing law relating to space, there are five United Nations treaties related to space. The United States is only a signatory to four of them. The last one was the Moon Agreement, and hardly anybody has signed on to that, and in fact, the United States, one aspect of the Moon Agreement says, let me take a step back, the Outer Space Treaty, which is probably the biggest one, essentially says you can't lay claim to the Moon, you can't own the Moon, you can't be the first to put a flag on Mars and say we own Mars now. The Moon Agreement went a step further, and the Moon Agreement says not only can you not say that you don't own the Moon, this is any state or, or party within the particular political state, you can't own anything from the moon or Mars or an asteroid. So it goes to the very extreme and you would not be able to do asteroid mining, for example, in a commercial nature. If you took anything back, you'd have to make it available to everybody for science purposes. Again, the United States did not sign on to that law. And in fact, the United States and Luxembourg have enacted laws that are exactly the opposite. Both the United States and Luxembourg say that, of course we can own things that are mined from asteroids or, or celestial objects. And so, going to the point on the antiquated nature though, the Moon Agreement was basically, I think it became a United Nations Agreement in the early 1980s when it finally was a treaty. So again, it's almost been 40 years since there's been an international treaty um, addressing these issues. That being said, the United Nations does have the Office for Outer Space Affairs. They also have the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. They're actively involved in addressing these issues. One of the interesting things at the most recent United Nations Conference on Space Law and Policy is the interaction uh, between the big players in the room e.g. The, the United States and Russia, and everybody else. There's, and, and particularly the developing countries that want to have a foothold in the space economy, they want to actually be a part of it. There's a lot of policies that the United States and Russia are adverse to um, that, that kind of are pushing them off to the side. So I think that right now we are under a structure under the Outer Space Treaty that nobody can lay claim or ownership to any particular space or any particular area in space. There is the spectrum management um, with the FCC here in the US and the International Telecommunications Union, but that's just one aspect of it. And it really begs for updated laws, not only on the federal domestic side, but internationally. We really have to get updated international laws. And if you're wondering why Luxembourg ended up on <laughs> that list, because it definitely stands out, uh, tax revenue. Um, they, so uh, when I was at Planet Labs, we were looking at what other space companies were doing from a uh, legal and tax structure, and it turns out that a lot of space companies are um, opening up their European headquarters in Luxembourg uh, for tax breaks that they're already being given just to locate a headquarters there, but then also uh, Luxembourg can then bring tax revenue from any commercial use of space if it's a headquarters. Very, very fine extra. Plus, it's also exciting for a country to say, look at all this cool space stuff we did. And for a country like Luxembourg, which is a little bit bigger than this room, it's cool <laughs> to be able to say stuff like that. Yeah, one particular company, SES, is, is big in Luxembourg, and they were a big lobbying effort. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit because I know uh, New Space Chicago, as an organization, wants to focus on, you know, specifically, you know, uh, building companies. Uh, in the 
the space industry. Um, as you know, as, as companies grow and as these um, satellites go up, how do operating you know single sat single satellite operators or small constellation satellite operators how the work that they do how is that different than you know these mega constellation operators uh, and the work that they have to perform to maintain keep and maintain their satellites. That's Dave. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, <laughs> it's a really good question because you're you're talking about an, an order of magnitude or more uh, in increasing the number of objects that you're managing basically. Um, so I'm I'm speculating here, but. Uh, you start to really get into, I think, the technologies that you might use to uh, manage something like the Internet of Things, where you have um, lots of object, uh, lots of devices that have to operate essentially autonomously, and you are um, uh, getting updates from them over time. But all of that uh, operation has to be done pretty uh, autonomously, uh, and so I think you'll see uh, probably a, a lot more. Um, I'll say machine learning, but, but sort of AI types of technologies being implemented to manage these large constellations. Um, something that we haven't really addressed in, in this uh, conversation so far is what what is the logistics of managing that constellation from a, a putting satellites up there but also maintaining them. Um, and so there's essentially a whole secondary business of satellite maintenance where uh, you have companies that will be sending uh, spacecraft to rendezvous with a particular satellite um, and refuel it or uh, repair it or swap out technologies or things like that. Um, these will be robotic spacecraft. So now you're talking about a case where you have robotic spacecraft that are autonomously rendezvousing with some satellite and doing something to it. And so this raises the question of how do we know that that, sat that that spacecraft is actually authorized to rendezvous with the given satellite and, and perform some function. Um, in, in line with what Ken was talking about, one of those functions is going to be deorbiting the satellite. So now imagine this is the case where um, somebody hacks into the um, control system for these uh, autonomous maintenance spacecraft and puts in an order to, de -orb to deorbit a competitor spacecraft or a uh, military. military satellite or something like that. So there's, there's in addition to that, a whole issue of cybersecurity that we really haven't had to address before because we've got all of these autonomous robotic spacecraft running around, uh, approaching uh, satellites, presumably legitimately, but we don't know. Um, so there's going to have to be a whole infrastructure to manage that as well. Um, and this, again, is going to end up being automated. So there's, there's really big questions there about how all of that is going to be uh, managed. Yes. It's also it's very automated. Just to give an example, I have a friend who uh, is a satellite operator for a European weather satellite, and he's one of probably 40 or 50 people that solely work on just that satellite. Uh, when I was in my <coughs> labs, we had a launch where I think we had 45 satellites get get deployed you know, over the course of a couple of minutes, and all those satellites were self were self commissioning. And so they would autonomously deploy their, they would deploy the solar array, and then they would automatically register at the ground station and uh, transmit telemetry and self-register onto our systems. And all of that was done with no with no human interaction. And so I think, and that was four years ago. And so I can only imagine what the technology has been able to do today with something like a Starlink with several hundred satellites that are kind of I think it's sixty or seventy satellites at launch, and they're doing that cadence every couple months. The cost structure and the infrastructure you build to support that type of model looks a lot different than my friend and his 39 colleagues that have to manage a single weather satellite. So one of the things that this starts to look like actually is um, uh, internet technologies. So uh, Planet to the customer basically looks like uh, a web services company. They're they're delivering data over the internet to customers. Um, the only difference is that instead of their servers being in um, some windowless building in Seattle, uh, they're all in orbit and they have cameras attached to them. Um, but the technologies for managing large server farms are essentially the same kinds of technologies that you're going to see being deployed for these large constellations of satellites. Basically the same thing, the only difference is they're in orbit rather than on the ground. Um, 
So 57,000 satellites plus however many that's going to be, uh, that needs to be serviced from these automated service uh, satellites. Um, I want to ask one last question and then we'll, we'll take a brief break. But, you know, how, how are we going to manage, we meaning uh, society at large or governmental organization or whoever is, you know, the solution, how are they going to manage all these satellites that go up to avoid, uh, you know, to avoid all the debris out there, to avoid creating the Kessler syndrome, to avoid potentially, you know, uh, uh, making radial astronomy uh, uh, obsolete? How, what, what are some of these solutions that are available to us in order to, you know, mitigate the negative impacts of mega con satellite constellations without, um, without, you know, taking away all the cool stuff that we're going to be able to do? If I can jump in really quick on my thoughts, I just want to be clear that I, for a number of reasons, um, I'm definitely pro-technology, I'm pro-satellite, I'm pro-using that, but at the same time, I'm a big advocate of the fact that you can be responsible in running a business. And in the same way that companies now need to be responsible about what they put into the water or they put into our own landfills and so forth. I think that we need to start thinking about that. Um, another parallel, you know, was commented earlier about the, the parallel between the internet farms and so forth. I would argue that internet regulation and, for example, privacy regulation is an analogy. When I would advocate to my clients, let's say the European Union has the data directive or now it's the GDPR, a company here in the United States that might not yet have European customers and they're talking about building the infrastructure and how they're handling customer data, they should be planning for the GDPR because if you start at the beginning and implement that kind of thinking, you're going to be ready for the future. And so I think that governments, domestically, internationally, as well as companies, need to be looking in the astronomy, astrophysics community Everybody that has an interest in space needs to be looking together on how best to manage that so that we can enjoy the technology, but we don't close out a particular industry in doing so. As, as a technologist, I think there are, and, and I'll, I'll leave the, the regulatory <laughs> answers to Charles, but as a technologist, I think that there are certain things that have to be, that, that will have to be done. Uh, we already talked about the, the 25 year rule for satellites to orbit. Um, so, in, in ensuring that that happens, that when a satellite reaches the end of its life, that it deorbits automatically um, is, is an important thing. Um, and there, there are uh, technologies available today that can monitor the satellite itself, and this would be a component that's attached to the satellite, that monitors the satellite's operation, and when it detects that it's not functioning anymore, it automatically initiates a deorbit operation independent of the satellite itself. Um, so. There, there are things like that that I think will have to be done. Um, uh, designing your satellite to be, ma to, to be um, maintained, to, to have, um, for example, grapple points where a maintenance spacecraft can attach to it and grab it and deorbit it if necessary, or swap out components or, or refuel it or what have you. I think those things are going to become necessary so that uh, the, the satellites can, can be maintained. Right now, we put something up there, and basically nobody ever sees it again because we have no way to get to it. But that's going to change. It's going to have to change. I would also say uh, to the point Charles made on you know some of these laws that we're working around are 40 years old. Uh, you know, governments in the UN are not necessarily known for moving exceedingly quick, and so that's why we have you know the Outer Space Treaty, which was signed in the 60s or 50s. 60s or yeah. So I mean, these are some very old regulations that we're working with. But I think when we think about these major constellations, these enormous constellations that we're talking about today, the mega constellations of a Starlink or an Amazon um, internet constellation, right? If I'm Starlink and Dave is Amazon, uh, Amazon's going to be a couple years behind Starlink in launching satellites. Dave has every interest in me conforming to some, uh, you know, space debris management or some kind of space traffic management techniques that are going to make it such that my satellites aren't going to interfere with anyone else's satellites because I might ruin the game for everybody. So I think in the near term, we're actually probably going to see a lot of these commercial entities, a lot of these for-profit companies having to self-regulate uh, because the actual government or UN regulations aren't going to evolve fast enough. 
but anyone that is kind of going against some of this self-regulation stands the potential to actually uh, create more restraint in a market or less opportunity in a market. And when we're thinking about something as competitive and as expensive as multi-billion dollar constellations, you don't really want to be the person that you know spoiled the game for everyone else. And, and part of that is also the development of voluntary standards. So industry organizations move a lot more rapidly than government, and they, they will develop standards as well. And, and I think some of those activities are starting already. And I, I don't want to just be the naysayer about this. You know, oh, cool. it's a wonderful. No, no, actually, <laughs> I, I no, I think it, it's. Um, you know, I just wanted to give a, a sober look at the uh, <laughs> like what could happen. What would be the worst case scenario? But also, it's an amazing opportunity because you know you have you know, like tethers, uh, you know, um, ink. You have um, some other like technologies, which it, it's a it's a opportunity for um, startups for new companies to say, okay, we need to solve this problem before it gets bad. And there's so there's a whole tech. Um, Sector out there that could actually benefit from new thought, new technologies. By the way, um, are you familiar with? Uh, I have not kept up in the last couple of years of CubeSat. Um, and most of the launches, I'm not mistaken, uh, you need a pretty extreme waiver to do any pressurized chambers, things like that. I was thinking for deorbiting. You know, uh, are you? Uh, it, it, it depends on what you're actually I, doing. So, uh, pre pressurized. For propulsion, for propulsion, yeah. have you are an issue if you're going through the space station. Okay, so um, but anything that's launched independently of the space station, that's that's not as much of an issue. You still have to do the range safety requirements yeah. and so forth. But you can get to because it. that's like one of those things where it's like if we understand the reality of, of the situation, maybe there could be some you know forgiveness into you know certain restrictions that say, hey, listen, we need this technology. And actually, just just yeah. um, a follow-on thought to that. Uh, one one of our, our partner companies has a propulsion technology, which um, at launch time, so when, when the satellite is being launched, or even at integration time, the, the propulsion system is not pressurized. Uh, and then once it gets on orbit, you decide, okay, I need to, to fire the thrusters. It can it can pressurize at that time. It's so really yeah. really yeah. interesting technology. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no. Excellent. Thank you for your uh, th thank you for your comments. Um, we're going to take a quick five minute break, and then when we come back, uh, feel free to use the bathroom, uh, grab another drink, and then we'll we'll take uh, additional audience questions. So um, bring those questions in mind, and then we'll we'll, we'll get them answered. All right. All right. Thank you. So we'll be back uh, at seven fifty or seven forty eight.
Does anyone have any questions? Yes, please. Hi. Do any current satellites have like a thrusters on them where the satellite could spot some de debris coming towards them and then they could adjust and get out of the way of the debris? So you're, you're talking about satellites being able to maneuver once they're deployed in space. Um, and the answer is yes, that's certainly possible. Um, it, it depends on the satellite itself. So when we talk about CubeSats, uh, particularly many of the early CubeSats, which were about this big, they didn't have propulsion. They, in fact, they, it's sometimes hard for them to even maintain attitude, so they might just tumble. Uh, but these days, uh, even even small satellites, CubeSats that are, that are this big might have might have a propulsive capability. Um, and there, there are other ways of maneuvering as well. Um, Dan might be able to speak to this a little more, but for example, the, the satellites that Planet deployed um, actually had the ability to uh, maneuver without propulsion. Uh, and you might ask, well, how does that happen? Uh, but those, those satellites have uh, solar panels that deploy. And so uh, there is some atmosphere in low Earth orbit. And so if, if you're going through space this way, you're going to generate drag. And so that will cause your, your, your orbit to come down. Um, or you might turn this way to your, your direction of travel. And you don't have any drag. So then you can continue to, to move uh, in that same orbit. So there, there are a variety of different things that, that can address that particular concern. Um, ultimately, uh, we, we want to see uh, satellites that have a propulsive capability so that they can um, avoid debris and, and other objects. And it was so, only a month ago yeah. that a Starlink satellite was going to come with that. It was the direct TV satellite. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was like, it, it was forecasted to come within, I want to say, like 50 or 100 meters. Yeah, it was ten feet. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, so they the Joint Space Operations Command that tracks all the different uh, pieces in orbit was able to forecast ahead of time and say based on the trajectories of these two satellites currently, there is a X percent possibility that they might actually collide and notify the companies to say, hey, your satellites could be on a could be on a collision course, and then I believe each of the satellites had propulsion. They were yeah, because these are the ones that geosynchronous, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's kind of the answer to your question is like uh, the big boys, you know, these, you know, hundreds of millions that, yeah, yeah. that are the ones that geosynchronous orbit, you know, um, com, com satellites, a lot of other satellites, uh, they're required. If you're that's a that parking space in geosynchronous orbit is precious, uh, they're all required to have collision avoidance. Um, now, some of these satellites go down and they don't have have control anymore, and that's where the, the troubles come in. But yeah, uh, when we're talking about these, these uh, mega constellations, a lot of them are small sets, you know, very nano sets, just like you're saying, size of shoebox. Those have other potential mitigation factors, that, that, that's like Dave was saying. Okay. So, um, Daniel, that would be like a, the decision to move would be uh, land based and it's sent back up to the satellites. Are there any satellites that would make the decision themselves? So, like, I'm just thinking of a camera, hey, something's coming towards us. I don't know if I need right okay. now. And that's also a function of, so even when I was a planet, we were all about, you know, automated commissioning and everything. Um, when it comes to something like propulsion, uh, I would be shocked if there was any satellite operator out there that would allow for right. uh, the satellite to make autonomous decisions <laughs> with propulsion. <laughs> Because that can go south real quickly. <laughs> you spend a couple hundred million on a satellite, a software bug deorbits it. <laughs> okay. It's not phenomenal. Uh, but like that was actually something that we've been asked when I was a planet. <laughs> uh, so to what Dave was to what Dave was commenting on, we would use we would use atmospheric drag to uh, phase out our satellites after launch, and then also when they would reach the towards the end of their service life, we would put them into a high drag mode so that they would eventually deorbit much faster. Uh, that we had discussions around, do we actually build in some kind of software code to say, hey, after a certain amount of time in orbit, automatically put the satellite into the high drag mode? Or do we um, you know, have the satellite automatically go into high drag mode if it hasn't been hit by a ground station in you know, more than 48 hours, whatever it might be, right? And like, the decision was made when I was there to not do that because, again, a software glitch or something could cause the entire constellation to choose to deorbit and we have no control over it. So even when there's not an onboard propulsion method, there's still a lot of resistance to allowing for some kind of automated program to do that. 
Yeah, a question. As far as, so I, I, I'm part of a community, we offer high speed internet via fixed wireless using like cell phone towers and microwave or millimeter wave for the last mile. And I've been telling our community like that the lower orbit constellation satellites are definitely going to pose a threat to our industry at some point in the near future. And um, they're like, no, it's not. They came to the speed. It's not going to be physically possible, you know. And 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 I was wondering, from your opinion, you know, your guys' opinion, um, as far as like the spectrum regulations, are they going to be? I've, I've got a few questions here. Part of this one, but basically, just kind of curious about the spectrum regulations. If you guys know anything about that, and if they're going to be sharing the same spectrum as like DirecTV or Dish, or one web is going to be sharing the same as um, Starlink, but they just got to figure it out to coordinate together because there's limited spectrum. And then also, what about um, recouping that, you know, the money via selling it? Um, are they going to be trying to go after a mixture of consumers and businesses all at the same time, or do you think they're going to target, prioritize like military and businesses, the Marine first to try to, like, you know, get that CapEx back? And then also, um, do you guys think it's going to be interfered? Like, do you think clouds are still going to interfere with it, even though we are a lot closer to the ground? I mean, there's a satellite. I just kind of wonder, um, I mean, with the atmospheric positions and how that that might affect, you know, the frequency as well and the transmissions. I'll let others talk about the technology. I'll just make a comment on the spectrum management, in that you know, the spectrum does have to be regulated so that nobody is trampling on anybody else. So just the analogy that I'll give you is the regulation of um, your AM and FM bands. I mean. You know, for example, if you're operating a radio station here, you can only have a certain number of watts so that your vicinity, you don't bleed into another particular um, station. And that's the kind of same kind of model that, that needs to be used. And with the FCC here domestically, and then the International Tech, uh, Telecommunications Union, that's the theory, is that that spectrum is allocated and so wherever those satellites are, they have the authorization to use the particular spectrum that they have, and they need to stay within those parameters. But as far as whether it's going to be better internet service than 5G, for example, I don't know. Uh, so from a commercial standpoint, and to, I think you're exactly what you're saying, you know, does my company need to be worried about uh, competition from satellite-based internet providers? So I think there's three reasons why I would say that like there is a potential to worry. Uh, the first of which, just being uh, telecommunications companies with satellites are not like other companies. So if another com if you think of just a standard manufacturing company that goes bankrupt or goes under because they can't sustain their costs, um, the assets get sold off or the company just kind of closes up shop and you're good to go. With a satellite, with a company that owns satellites, the company might go bankrupt, but that satellite is probably still up and operating. Someone's going to eventually be buying that satellite from you and taking the bandwidth that's on it or being able to apply it in some way. So the actual asset that's in space isn't going anywhere, so it's still going to be there. The second thing is if we think about who's launching some of these constellations, you're looking at someone like Amazon, who for their entire history has been a loss leader. So they don't actually mind taking a loss on one part of their business and find that a different part can subsidize it. So it wouldn't surprise me if someone like Amazon actually uses cash flow from AWS or something to then subsidize the cost that they can provide satellite-based internet. And then the third reason is, I don't know if many of you remember taking Uber here in Chicago six or seven years ago, but that was back in the heyday of all the major discounts that Uber and Lyft were handing out left and right. And you could get an Uber from Wrigley Field to the Loop for like $4, right? And because it was just constant subsidies to get customers to join the network. And I think when we have constellations like a OneWeb, uh, Starlink, Amazon, when we have a ton of competitors in the space that are all trying to serve the exact same product, you're eventually going to see that price come down. And particularly for customer acquisition, I think you're going to see a lot of subsidies like that. Although, I, I one point on that, if you look at some of the stock prices for satellite companies over the last six months, particularly like SES and Intelsat, an FCC decision right now deciding on how to allocate spectrum and it was like a nine billion I think deal or nine trillion deal I forget the exact zeros but the FCC decision had a dramatic impact on the stock price of two at least two particular companies if you look at Intelsat like just about six months ago within the last year definitely I think it was at about 27 and it's trading tenth its value there are other aspects, the corner of 
coronavirus and everything like that, but I think that those spectrum allocation decisions, FCC or Europe and so forth, do have a significant impact on the company's viability. What about the technology part? Do you think that there is an issue with the interference? Is the um, yeah, there is definitely a, a, an issue, and I don't remember if it was one web or one of the others, but uh, when they, they were licensing, actually, they had to agree that um, when their satellites were coming uh, uh, in view of the, uh, the beams from some, some communication satellite in geosynchronous, uh, they basically had to turn off so that they would not interfere with the, the transmissions from the geosynchronous satellite. And I don't remember exactly which, which companies were involved, but it was definitely an issue that they yeah. were concerned about the interference. So the, the technical solution was the, the, the satellite in low Earth orbit basically had to turn itself off to, to, to not interfere. What about cloud penetration? Um, it was billion, not trillion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now you're suddenly a little stronger. Yeah. Not yours, but now you're a little stronger. I was going to say, like, you could do uh, the link budget analysis if you wanted. It's a 12.7 gigahertz uh, downlink from. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah. What kind of power is that? Did you just start with this? Uh, I don't, I, they've changed the tech specs a few times. Yeah. It's like they got in place for different, different orbits and then also tested stuff out, so I'm not actually sure. Um, a lot of it also just depends on the terminal that people are going to have to have in their homes for a lot of these internet constellations. Yeah. And the most recent thing I read today was, I want to say, I think it was one where I was promising that they were going to get the module in the home down to like 1500 bucks or $1,000 or something, and that's not an insignificant cost. And so even though I said it myself, you know, oh, like, you know, satellite-based internet can be really great for people in rural populations or people that might not otherwise have access to internet. A lot of those folks that don't have access to internet probably also don't have $1,500 to just right. spend on an Elon Musk design in California Starlink module to put outside. <laughs> so there's there's some stuff that's still going to have to be worked there. They're definitely betting <laughs> on populated areas with money to fund the internet service. I, I can't remember the name of the company, but there's, there's another company that is talking about building a, a constellation that would be able to talk to your cell phone. I saw that today. Yeah, I, uh, I, I came across this like six months ago, yeah. um, and I, d I don't remember the company, but... So, Sphere. The name of the company is Sphere. That's trying to do that. Sphere? Fia. T-A-E-B. Oh, Fia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I mean, yeah. So yeah. the, the, yeah. the advantage yeah. here is, of course, that they don't need an expensive <clears throat> ground station. Now, how you communicate back to the satellite in orbit with your cell phone, I don't know. But they they were claiming it would be just based on cell phone technology. I think they just raised like $11 million or something in funding, or like a, or $100 million in funding. We're not big on orders of magnitude. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, they've definitely raised, There's there are investors that think there's a lot of interesting opportunity here. So. Uh, Companies like that are still point money into it. Now, the interesting one is, so we're, we're talking about radio communications here, but there are also companies that are developing optical communications um, for, for use from space to ground. So optical communications between satellites, as inter-satellite links is relatively obvious, but um, they're, they're talking about using optical communications to the ground, and how they plan to go through clouds, I don't know, but they, they, at least one company that I'm aware of claims that they can do that. And the Chinese government's been investing a lot in that technology in the past couple of years as well. So there's also a big government money behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, so how do you envision the industry practically keeping track of who puts what out there and where it exactly is, considering the fact the industry is becoming a lot more global? So different countries are putting a lot more different satellites out there and is there one sensor where we're keeping track of where everything is to avoid the Kessler syndrome, um, for example, or is that something that we're still trying to figure out? So, the, yeah, the, the, joint, the yeah. joint Space Operations Command um, is uh, currently tasked with tracking all objects in space. So, they are um, an agency or, or an well, office it's in the military. of, of yeah. the U.S. military. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is that they are trying very hard to get rid of that responsibility and move it <laughs> off to 
a commercial organization to do the same thing. Um, so now that's just in the U.S. and obviously there are also similar organizations in other countries that, that are doing similar things. Although the JSPOC is, is sort of the, the primary one at this point. Okay. Um, but as the constellations become bigger and there become more objects in space, obviously it becomes a much uh, a much bigger challenge to, to deal with. And there's the United Nations has a database that's self-reporting for people, but the issue is that governments don't necessarily publicly report where all of their military satellites are. So you're never going to have a complete database of where every satellite happens to be. But if it's large enough, it can be tracked. Yeah, so sure. even, if, even if they don't, in fact, that was the, on the, on the uh, space track, let's see, there, there's a large number of uh, ones that are to be determined uh, unknown. <laughs> so there are, they do track, I mean, you know, something in orbit's in orbit. There's a you know, physical formula once you get enough signals of it, you know. But um, just a little anecdote about five years ago, I was at the uh, CubeSat workshop, and the, the keynote speaker was the general who was the head of um, the, you know, the Joint Space Command. And uh, his first opening line to the CubeSat conference was, stop it. <laughs> he, was, he said, you guys are driving us nuts. I mean, it's just, you know, just, and I can imagine he's probably retired now, hopefully, because, you know, that 50,000 number or whatever, you know, which is, they need to track all these things. They're the ones that also give um, warnings for any potential collisions, and they have to do all the math and all the, uh, the work to make sure that everything that's, that they can track in orbit uh, is, has a known uh, collision uh, rate, or no collision chance. There's also so as part of the um, as as part of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, the country that launches a satellite, so the country that the satellite is launched from, and there's some other technical stuff there because also the country is built in, but essentially the country that the satellite was launched from, that country is then responsible for that satellite if it were to crash on Earth or something and kill someone, right? Like the if it was a U.S. satellite that crashed on Earth, uh, the U.S. government would ultimately be liable. Obviously, they would push that liability out of the company that owned the satellite. But particularly when we think of something like a mega constellation like this, uh, they're absolutely going to be going through the regulatory processes to get a license to actually go into space. Um, they're not going to be kind of trying to like skirt the regulations to get around that because they're ultimately going to be held liable. The government's going to come after them, right? Um, yeah. And then like the other components of that ends up being uh, like if you don't get licensure and if you don't kind of follow all the processes, you start wondering track of where all the satellites are, or where all of your satellites are, um, there's kind of like a public shame that exists. And so uh, a year, I think it was a year ago, it might have been two years ago, the Planetary Society uh, launched Light Sail. So the Planetary Society is Carl Sagan's uh, organization to promote planetary exploration. It's currently headed by Bill Nye. Um, and they launched a satellite that had this huge sail on it, and they were trying to use solar radiation to see if they could uh, move that, or, add velocity to an in-orbit satellite. On that same launch, there was a like one or two U CubeSat that some random startup had managed to get on the rocket and just promised the launch service provider, yeah, 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 like we're about to get, like we're, we're about to get licensure, you don't have to worry. Um, and they didn't. And the public shame, like the space community is relatively small. Uh, and so that company got utterly shamed and fined and like they, have then had to come forward and say, like, we won't let this ever happen again. So I think there's also just some like collective shaming that can be done to reduce the risk of that. Uh, in just that particular case, did it turn out that they couldn't remove the satellite from the launch vehicle? So it was, it was integrated and it, it was launched but not actually deployed from the launch vehicle? It might have been that, but they still got fined. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. But I think you're right. I think there was some, there was some difficulty there. One interesting thing is that um, there is a, one of those other five outer space uh, or space related treaties. There is a specific treaty that talks about liability um, and assessing the, the mechanism for countries to assess liability for, as you said, a satellite or something coming down or collision in space. But the interesting thing is that it does not address when ownership is transferred, so if one country transfers ownership or operation of a satellite to another country, the original launching country is still liable under the treaty. 
Um, that's not necessarily how the countries would like it, but that's the way that the treaty reads. And there's actually no provision for commercial liability whatsoever. So you'd be relating to, you'd be trying to go back to the specific country to assess that. And so there are still, again, liability issues that, um, or regulatory issues, legal issues that need to be updated to address all these concerns. To, to Starlink, they released coordinates of where their constellation is going to be, um, and they're like, okay, the astronomy, astronomy community, you guys can plug in this data set and plan accordingly. Now, do you think that idea of releasing coordinates will scale across countries, um, or how will that affect these two different parties of the private space and the public um, space exploration space of trying to I work think together. Good, good your response it was shaming. Uh, in fact, that's why Starlink has been. Uh, they like, for example, they, they said they're they're putting on this now uh, low reflective coating. Uh, trying, they got that shame. I think in that those first few launches um, and. Um, they realize they need to answer those questions, or as as a company, I mean, you know, who wants to uh, be part of and invest in something that's actually is a universal uh, appeal against it, you know? I mean, so um, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, there's that. And then to the point earlier, so the Joint Space Joint Space Operations Command doesn't just track U.S. satellites; it tracks every satellite. It. So it's not like we're reliant on China or Russia to share with us where their satellites are going to be. And in fact, I was saying to some folks. Um, Earlier in the night, there uh, was a company that came to visit me when I was in school uh, that they just put telescopes on people's roofs um, and just take constant pictures throughout the night, and they can actually determine orbital parameters for uh, uh, basically almost any same size. Or they have a little bit bigger size they have to find because they don't have the same technology as JSPOC. But you can, just by putting a telescope on your roof and a camera on it, you can begin to track satellites yourself too. So there's we're, we're not reliant on self-reporting unless yeah. someone's going to start throwing up satellites that are like the size of my shoe. Um, Got it. And at that point, I, I, that's that's a future society's problem. We don't have to worry about that <laughs> for the next couple decades, probably. One point, though, on reporting and tracking and so forth, and orders of magnitude, just to give you an idea, though, we were talking about numbers and the tens of thousands of objects and so forth. Um, but if you go onto the ESA, European Space Agency, space debris tracking website, there are an estimated 200 plus million objects between one millimeter and one centimeter. And you think that that's small, but again, going to the speeds that we were talking about, those objects orbiting Earth and the collision with a particular object, such as, you know, there was an issue with the Russian side of the ISS, there was actually a piece of debris that had collided with the windshield of the space shuttle. Um, so even those small fragments are significant. And those really, when you get down to that size, there's no way to track um, those objects. Yeah, you, you get a good point. Uh, it's the fundamentally the power law. You know, if you have 100 things that are 10 meters, uh, you're going to have 1,000 things that are 1 meter. You're going to have 10,000 things that are, you know, 10 meters. So you're right. Those, the ones I, I talked about those 45,000 that are being uh, tracked, those are just objects that are about, about 10 centimeters larger. Uh, so, and you're right, below that you can just project, you know, uh, how many there are, and those things are, are bullets, you know? I mean, if you have something this big traveling 30,000 miles per hour, and you're, you're a CubeSat, you're just gonna be toasted. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, one of the astronauts on the space station last year, the year before, uh, lost track of a wrench that they were using, and there were like 15 articles written about it, <laughs> because it added space debris. And it was also funny to say an astronaut lost a But, you know, we, like, those are certainly things that, um, yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the smaller degree that's moving at 30,000 kilometers an hour relative to you that you have to worry about. So um, if, let's say, China, Russia, the U.S. wanted to launch a satellite uh, and kind of hide it from um, the other parties, are they able to? So I have a fun story on this one because <laughs> I had, uh, it's only top of mind for me. This past week, I went to Kennedy Space Center. I snuck off from work to spend an afternoon there. Uh, and I had one of the launch pads is the X is the X thirty seven B warehouse essentially. And the the, the X thirty seven B is a um, Air Force mission. It looks like a mini space shuttle. 
and it spans on the order of a year or more in its space. No one knows what it does, uh, but it lands really cool. It lands just like the space shuttle. And so anytime it comes back to Earth, there's a ton of articles written about it. Well, uh, in its last mission, um, it deployed two CubeSats, and uh, the military didn't tell anyone. And then, you know, as some of these other commercial tracking stations began to find it, uh, you then began to see news articles being written. And then when the X-37B landed, uh, the Air Force came out and said something about, oh, we also you know, had the successful deployment of a couple of satellites. And so it was uncovered because, again, anything that's going to have utility is going to be, you know, is going to have enough volume or mass that it's going to be able to be tracked. But it, it, it was not immediate that folks were able to recognize that the satellites were, that the satellites were deployed. So one thing to keep in mind is that um, the U.S. military and presumably the Russian military and probably the Chinese military have been tracking orbital launches for the last 50 or 60 years. And so it's really not possible to put something in space without it, it being known. Um, of course, then that's that's just launching the orbit. Then, then you have the, the situation that, that Dan just described where you have uh, the potential to, to deploy additional satellites. Um, but again, the, it's easy to observe things. For the uh, for the category of non-governmental satellites, um, and I'll pick like the bigger companies like SpaceX and Amazon. Do they manufacture these satellites in house? And are those satellites again not the non-governmental ones? Are they highly proprietary in nature? Uh, I can just comment briefly that an organization relating to or wanting to talk with SpaceX about the light issue um, for some of them to specifically work with SpaceX, which has been cooperative. They had to sign NDAs and are completely not able to talk about, even with their, their own organization members, about those kind of discussions. So I would guess that SpaceX is making them in-house, or if they're components made outside, they're all under NDAs and top secret to use the military term. Planet is pretty uh, out there with their, you know, they, they weren't so proprietary in a sense. I mean, yeah, so we would have, we had uh, in the, uh, in like the legal classification of like various secret sites, so like you could patent something and then it's kind of open to everyone. You can go on the US Patent and Trademark Office website and you can see the technical specs and designs. Uh, for Planet Labs, like we did not file many patents because then people would see all the technology, but we would share the high-level architecture of, you know, it's a 3 year CubeSat, uh, the telescope takes up roughly 80-90% of the bus, uh, we had a thing called the tuna can on the end that had all of, like the star cams and were able to measure telemetry and such, so we put some details out there, but one of the challenges of putting really complex satellite technology architecture into the mainstream is, and Charles, I know you can speak a ton to this, but we run into things like uh, ITAR and EAR restrictions, which are US restrictions on the sharing of uh, complex technologies. And even though commercial companies are, you know, maybe not always serving government customers, uh, they're still subject to those to those regulations. And so uh, in the case of Planet Labs, where I was at, uh, if you were not a US citizen, you had to apply for a license just to be able to view the satellite specifications. And uh, like there were just, it was really difficult to get at that level of complexity to understand the intricacies of a lot of those satellites. And, and you know, just to add a caveat to what I said, but dovetailing on that, I mean, there is some technical information that's provided, like even when you apply with the FCC to get your license, you have to provide some technical information. And you can go online and find all of the applications and all their exhibits and so forth. They're publicly accessible. Um, but that is a good point that you know, to stay compliant with ITAR and here, you're not going to publicly disclose the information that, that could send you to prison. Yeah. If you want to click around though, there's a really fun website called Gunter's Space Page. It's, it's literally just run by a dude, Gunter, who loves space, and you can look up every satellite, every launcher since Sputnik, uh, pretty much. And you can view the mass, the, you know, size, the, you know, the version number of that satellite, uh, there's a ton of information you can view about it. And if you've ever gone down a Wikipedia hole, you can do the <laughs> same thing on this guy's website. It's really interesting.
Now, when these satellites or the mega constellations go up, do they each have like a set orbit they have to follow, like shipping lanes or flight patterns for commercial aircraft, or is it like a free for all? You get it up there, you decide where it goes. It's a good point. Um, at, at this point, there isn't anything like defined uh, shipping lanes uh, in, in space. Um, and you saw the video before, it looked like a cloud. So each satellite is following its own particular orbit, but when you're talking about a constellation, they're all going to have different orbits. Um, some of them may be following, you may have multiple satellites in the same orbit going around, but then that's only in one plane. There's going to be a different plane of other satellites and so forth. So those, the, the intricacies of orbital dynamics are more what drive that rather than specifically define um, lanes. But there would be on planes, though, right? I mean, the, they do get set to specific heights. They have a particular inclination. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's, it, all, it ultimately becomes a function of money. If you can pay your launch service provider enough money to get you to the orbit you want to go to, you go to the orbit. That's fine. Um, but uh, for a lot of these small sets, a lot of them are guided on what's called secondary payloads. So they're not going to be the primary payload on the rocket. And so as a small set launcher, or as an organization that would be launching a lot of small sets, you might ultimately just be subject to the whims of whatever the primary payload on that launch would be. So if that primary payload is going into a certain orbit, congratulations, that's the orbit you get to have, unless your spacecraft has some kind of propulsion. So when we get however many thousands up there and they're flying on their own at whatever orbit they got up to, are these companies expecting a certain amount of loss from collisions? They they will expect a certain amount of loss in the sense that um, if a satellite may fail to function or just run out of power or whatever. So so that kind of loss I I think people expect, but yeah, we don't want to see them colliding. What is the insurance agency uh, position on? Uh, Sure, that's a good question. On space debris or potential um, potential collisions like that, I'm not sure, but uh, you can go online or I could even find a blog post for it, but um, the space insurance industry uh, is absolutely peaks and valleys. There is no like steady state like we experience X percent losses each year, um, and that includes for on-orbit satellites. And so you can get insurance for an on-orbit satellite that ceases to function. You don't typically get individual satellite insurance for some of these big constellations. As Dave said, you have enough numbers that you can assume that you know two to three percent are going to fail and. As long as you have a big enough network, it's fine. Uh, but Digital Globe, the company I mentioned before that provides all the imagery for uh, Google Maps, their worldview for satellite uh, broke last year or the year before. Uh, and so they had to file an insurance claim for like $400 million or something on it. And so there, there is a way to get insurance on satellites, but for a mega constellation like this, you're probably just going to more rely on safety numbers. So you're, you're going to insure the constellation. Yeah. Individual satellites. yeah, you can probably try and do that. It's a function of then also, are there going to be enough insurance carriers to insure that risk? Well, and, and you mentioned the, the World View 4 that failed last year. That, that insurance claim actually broke the space insurance market yeah. last year. Um, and that was one claim. Yeah. And so, point. like, when I say peaks and valleys, like, as soon as you see a rocket explode, you get to say, cool, space insurance had a bad year. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, like, it is absolutely peaks and valleys. One year the insurance industry is going to make tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on it, and then the next year they all experience a loss. There's also only like two or three brokers that will actually work to do space insurance. So as we say, the space market is small, the space insurance market is like four days. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, I mean, what kind of risk is there of these making it out of orbit to where it can actually go to hitting something, or do they burn up? It gotta be big, yeah, it gotta be big enough. Usually the stuff in Elliot, low Earth orbit, is not big enough that it's gonna Except for like the ISS. That's what we yeah, that's yeah. We don't want a true, yeah, true exactly. gravity situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, what I'm saying is that those, uh, all these um, CubeSats, none of them would ever make it through the atmosphere. Yeah. Like if you guys have seen the end of Apollo 13 when they're coming back to the atmosphere and you see like the plasma just like going right past the window, like it's not the exact velocity, but you can picture a satellite the size of like a large cat trying to go through that. Like it's probably not gonna. It's, 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 it's not making it to the surface. There's also, for the bigger satellites, when they do deorbit and there is an expectation that they are going to reach the surface, uh, there's actually a satellite graveyard in the Southern Pacific. Um, there's a really fascinating, there's a fascinating Wikipedia page on it. But pretty much any country that has a very large satellite that is going to cease functioning or they just need to orbit, 
uh, this like graveyard in the Southern Pacific has like hundreds of satellites that have been converted into it. They just dropped the Chinese space station there yeah. years ago, yeah. What impact does that have uh, environmentally? Good question. Uh, I think right now folks are relying on just that uh, the ocean there is deep enough that the ocean will destroy whatever was there with just the deep intense pressure, but also because it's in international waters, uh, there's not been a ton of, I think folks are more convinced of the great garbage patch, I think it's <laughs> a little bit more pressing attention than the satellite graveyard. Um, there, there's but, a similar area kind of east of Kennedy Space Center where boosters have been dropped into the ocean for decades. Um, they found Saturn V at one end of this. Like, the ocean like a year ago, or yeah. two years ago, yeah. But that's interesting that even on like the FCC application for a satellite operation, that from the FCC's perspective, that aspect is just not even on the radar. It's not an environmental concern, so everybody can check and say, no, there's no environmental impact. I correct me if I'm wrong too, but that is exact. Go on, no, no, go ahead. It's that exact reason true around the environmental impact that. Uh, I believe no satellites anymore launch with uh, radioactive uh, thermoisotope electric generators. Because uh, there's a concern that during launch the satellite might explode and then you would spread radioactive debris. And so, uh, like the Voyager missions, uh, they have an RTG on them. That's how they're still able to function after 40 years in space. Um, and we haven't seen satellites launch well, with those. Out of curiosity, had it. Oh, it is an RTG. Okay. Yeah, we'll and, and <laughs> the, I think what you're uh, probably responding to was there is actually a, a shortage of it that we have, oh, yeah. and then, so that's why plan missions weren't putting it into the mission. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't But yeah. Yeah. actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if you guys are wondering what we're talking about with an RTG, go see the movie The Martian. It's the thing he digs up in the ground. He was like big, big. I don't know how big it is on Voyager, uh, but it's essentially a big canister that's then filled with balls of. Uh, some isotope, I don't know, but, it. yeah, but then, I, like, every ball is insulated, so that, like, if someone were to drop it, it wouldn't just immediately be a radioactive and environmental disaster, uh, but it generates heat, and then that heat is used to uh, generate electricity that powers the spacecraft. Uh, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Did you? I, um, I don't know how relevant this question is. Um, the space elevators, are those? Yep. They ever become viable? Or is so, that just... space elevator is a really interesting science fiction concept. Okay. Um, the challenge with the space elevator is the tensile strength of the material you can make the, the cable yeah. out of, uh, because you're basically talking about a 24,000 mile long cable. Um, there's some other interesting environmental challenges associated with that, but um, to my way of thinking, we're unlikely to see a space elevator from Earth in our lifetimes. Um, however, uh, a space elevator on the moon is a very interesting concept and it's quite feasible uh, because the moon has less gravity and, and so forth. It's so, right. And, and the drag, yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it is a possibility elsewhere, but probably not on Earth. Yeah. It's the, just to give a sense, like, isn't it uh, the length of the cable would go like 20% of the way to the moon or something like that? Like, uh, there's well, 24,000 miles. Yeah, so like, like this orbit. Yeah, so, so it's not 20% not well, of the way to the moon. 10, 12 percent, like it's a meaningful distance to the moon. <laughs> yeah. Would it have to be the length of this cable yeah. to have this be viable at all? Um, and the biggest thing we've ever put into space is the International Space Station, that's the size of a football field. And so, 24,000 mile cable is going to be. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go invest in some mining companies if we're going to start going that way. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's give a round of applause for our panelists. A couple of quick announcements, uh, upcoming events. So uh, one of our, our, our next month's event is gonna be April 14th. Um, so uh, for those of you guys that are uh, email, uh, that are subscribed to our email, keep an eye out for that. Uh, early May, we are going to be uh, hosting a Mars City State Design Competition. Uh, that's uh, uh, in partnership with the Mars Society. Basically, uh, we, design a city-state on Mars to support a, a million people, and there are uh, prizes associated with that, with the report due uh, at the end of June. Uh, we are both hosting the event and actually uh, uh, sponsoring a team, is that correct? 
Um, yeah, so just, just to be clear, the Mars Society is, spon is sponsoring this competition. Um, there will be multiple teams from around the country and possibly around the world. Uh, we want to sponsor a team from New Space Chicago and, and, and an event where we can put some ideas together. Yeah, so if you're interested in that, uh, definitely keep an eye out. And then lastly, uh, October 2nd through the 4th is uh, NASA SpaceX, uh, Space Apps. Uh, it's a 24-hour, excuse me, 48-hour hackathon. So if you guys have ever been involved in that, that's very, very similar. Uh, uh, NASA proposed challenges. Last year they proposed six challenges. Uh, and then they have a variety of awards that uh, they get to give out. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if you or anyone you know or a company that you work for is interested in becoming a sponsor, uh, please uh, let um, Dave, Mr. David Hurst know. Uh, very interested. Uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, being an event sponsor, a $250 per event, and then a premier sponsor where you're invited for all the events and your uh, uh, the, the benefits uh, last for the entire year. All right. Um, any other questions at this point? Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time tonight. I hope you guys learned something and had a good time. Uh, feel free to stick around and chat if you would like. Uh, but otherwise, there's still more beer. There is still more beer, yes. And thank uh, you for moderating. Yeah, well, thank you.